Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. Um, I know people are still tricking on in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome and thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Chris McCahill. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of the State Smart Transportation Initiative, SSTI. Um, and you are here joining us today for Advancing Complete Streets Among State DOTs. Um, as many of you know, uh, lots of states um, have complete streets policies. Um, and um, what we'll be hearing today from a handful of folks who are really uh, working to um, push those policies through the agency and, and really make sure um, that they're having the intended effect. Um, so really excited to hear from those folks we've got. Um, just a brief rundown, we've got um, Jackie DeWolf uh, joined with uh, Francisco Lavera from the Massachusetts DOT. We've got Celeste Gilman from the Washington State DOT and Nissa Tupper from the Minnesota DOT. Um, the way we're going to work things today is uh, we're going to have a short presentation from each of them, um, followed by 10 or 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, so at any time, uh, you can enter your questions into the Q&A box, and we'll be watching those and trying to answer a handful of those um, at the end, um, as many as we can get to. Uh, just for a reminder for folks, um, today's webinar is uh, available for one AICP credit. So I'll drop a link to um, that information in, in just a second. Um, and, and for those of you wondering, today's webinar will be recorded. Uh, so you should be able to access that on our website um, later today or tomorrow. Um, we'll also be sharing around a brief survey at the end um, just to find out um, how, you got, how you all uh, like the, the webinar. And um, so we'd appreciate you keeping an eye out for that and uh, answering it. Um, before we launch into things, um, I know many of you may be new to our organization, um, so I just wanted to give a brief introduction. Um, first of all, uh, the State Smart Transportation Initiative, SSTI. Um, we work mainly with uh, state DOTs across the country through convening and technical assistance um, to promote transportation practices that advance environmental sustainability and equitable economic development while maintaining high standards of governmental efficiency and transparency. Uh, we're also joined with our uh, parent organization, uh, Smart Growth America, which envisions a country where no matter where you live or who you are, you can enjoy living in a place that is healthy, prosperous, and resilient. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually hand things over to Ray Labellis, uh, who is the director of Thriving Communities at Smart Growth America and is going to be uh, moderating throughout today. So Ray, take it away. Thanks, Chris. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Ray Labellis, and I am the director of Thriving Communities here at Smart Growth America. <laughs> do a quick change over here. Uh, I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes. I want to say I'm really thrilled to be co-hosting this webinar with SSTI. Smart Growth America, in case anyone doesn't know, hosts the National Complete Streets Coalition, which has led the national um, complete streets advocacy movement over the past couple decades. I've been involved in a lot of our uh, complete streets work over the um, decade plus that I've been with Smart Growth America. Um, and I am really excited to be in the virtual room with some real uh, Complete Streets leaders uh, today. So Smart Growth America defines Complete Streets as an approach, uh, basically. So it's an approach to planning, designing, building, operating, and maintaining uh, transportation systems to enable safe access for everyone using them, whether they're walking, whether they're biking, rolling, taking transit, driving, however they're getting around using our streets, they should be able to do so safely comfortably and conveniently. Um, so just to put a finer point on that, again, we see complete streets as an approach. So it's not just about how we design streets. It's not just about those uh, specific infrastructure changes. It's an entire paradigm, basically, of decision making. It's a change in a lot of cases to how we make uh, transportation decisions in the US. Um, what that means is that um, in many cases means um, first making some sort of policy commitment or high level commitment to embedding a complete streets approach into decision making at different levels. And then actually doing the, um, in many cases, very challenging work of actually changing all of the practices uh, so that you're actually considering balancing and meeting the needs of all of those different modes of transportation at different levels of decision making, whether that's in project development and project delivery, whether that's in the decisions about how to uh, fund uh, projects with limited resources at all different levels, actually embedding that multimodal um, perspective so that we get the, the good projects on the ground that we wanna see that ultimately create these um, safe, inviting, comfortable uh, multimodal networks. We've been um, really thrilled um, at, at Smart Growth America to see the growth in the National Complete Streets movement over the past couple decades, this concept of complete streets has really taken off from being sort of something that um, 
wasn't well known to, I would say, al almost a household name within our, our field, um, at least FHWA has a, a, a relatively new or updated Complete Streets initiative. Um, it's really exciting to see that leadership at the federal level. We at Smart Growth America have been tracking Complete Streets policy adoption um, for over two decades and um, have just been uh, blown away by the growth in Complete Streets policy adoption that's taken place. So this was as of 2000, you can see just a handful of Complete Streets policies around the country. And then as of last year, um, significant growth in adoption of some sort of policy commitment to Complete Streets at the state level, at the regional level, and at the local level. Um, but what we find is that um, in many of these cases, just that policy commitment alone, again, isn't really leading to um, the types of changes we want to see in terms of what's getting built on the ground because those practices aren't actually changing. So it really takes, like I said, pretty significant, um, often challenging work to, to change those embedded uh, practices, to change agency decision-making culture. I think this is often especially uh, difficult at the state level. Um, so like I said, I'm just so thrilled to to, to be here with some uh, leaders that are really uh, doing great work on complete streets at the state level. So with that, I'm gonna stop talking and uh, give them a chance to share what they're working on. Um, so I'll just mention them briefly now and then introduce them one at a time. We have Celeste Gilman from the Washington State Department of Transportation. She's the Strategic Policy Advisor in WashDOT's Active Transportation uh, Division and she's leading the implementation of the state's complete streets legislation. And then we have a dynamic duo from the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, Jackie DeWolf and Francisco Lavera. Uh, Jackie is the Deputy Secretary for Policy. Francisco is uh, the State Complete Streets Engineer, so they'll be providing those dual perspectives. And then Nissa Tupper with the Minnesota Department of Transportation, who's the Transportation and Public Health Planning Director. So again, super uh, thrilled uh, to welcome all of them. And with that, I'm just going to turn things right over to Celeste. Thank you, Rayla, for that great introduction. And I will share my screen here. So it's wonderful to be here with all of you today. Uh, we have also been uh, implementing Complete Streets in Washington for a couple decades. Uh, you saw that on the, the larger national map. Uh, this is blown in. Uh, blown up to, to the state of Washington, you can see we have uh, dozens of jurisdictions that have adopted complete streets policies as a State Department of Transportation. We have uh, our vision as an agency is that people have access to safe, sustainable, integrated transportation, multimodal transportation network. Uh, and we keep adding to the, the, the tools to support this work, uh, including uh, our 2021 20, statewide active transportation plan. What is new is that this past spring, uh, Complete Streets efforts took a decisive step from incremental and opportunistic to standardized and accelerated our state legislature passed into law that in order to improve the safety, mobility, and accessibility of state highways, it's the intent of the legislature, the department must incorporate the principles of complete streets, facilities that provide street access with all users in mind, including pedestrians, bicyclists, and public transportation users. This new requirement went into effect for state transportation projects starting design on or after July 1st of this year that are over 500,000. One of the things, major things this does is that it makes completing the walking and bicycling network a baseline need in our state transportation projects. And that allows us that while we are out stewarding our mature highway system, that we can add to and work to develop our currently underdeveloped active transportation system really build infrastructure that aligns with our state and community goals. So we, the, this new requirement went into effect July 1st of this year. We had a very rapid, basically two month uh, time period from the passage of the legislation to the effective date where we mobilized to put into place uh, policies and process processes, guidance 
so that we could meet the, the, the new requirement. This included uh, development of a project delivery memo, which is a tool that we have that, that complements and as needed supersedes our design manual. And uh, we assembled a, a, a team and, and utilized uh, the, the, the team's platform, in fact, uh, to build a place where people could easily access the information that they needed, the guidance documents, other resources. Uh, we have about 450 members uh, of that team's channel now. And we kind of took as our touchstones um, an approach of, of good enough for now, safe enough to try, that timeliness was critical and that we would try things and learn from them and iterate forward uh, and to do so in a way where we're being sincere and practical. So one of the key things in that is that we established multidisciplinary complete streets teams in all of our regions. And these teams brought together our existing staff who already had the greatest level of subject matter expertise and experience in active transportation and complete streets and brought with them also a lot of enthusiasm for implementing this, this new requirement. The first step for all of our projects is to screen them to understand whether uh, the requirement applies to them. And I will talk more about that in, in subsequent slides. Then once we know uh, if a project is subject to the complete streets requirement, to go through an alternatives development process, multidisciplinary within uh, the agency, working with stakeholders and community members, it's really critical that as we're bringing changes to communities that we're that those are changes we're making with them uh, not to them uh, once we have a preferred concept then the project will move uh, more into the traditional uh, delivery stream but our region complete streets teams will have ongoing touch points throughout the development of the process so that there is they continue to be a resource for our design teams. And there's that uh, consistency that we see things through all the way through to construction that they're matching with that original vision. So the screening of projects, uh, all projects over 500,000 need uh, are required to be screened. Uh, our, headquarters capital budget office will not authorize funding for a project uh, until it has been screened and the what we're doing through that screening project process we're we're really looking to focus uh, our resources on those places where there's that uh, it's a context where there's a higher potential for the types of short trips that are well suited to walking and bicycling so we are looking first, is the project an incorporated city? If it's an incorporated city, then it will be forwarded for complete streets analysis. Even if it's not an incorporated city, we have a lot of places that are census designated places, the population centers, they have built, they, they've been developed in a way that feels like a city or town, even though it isn't incorporated. And so if it's in a population center, uh, that's outside of a city, we really want to be building on the planning work that's occurred. So is there an identified active transportation gap that we've identified through our WashDOT planning work or that our local partners have identified through their planning work? If so, then that project will go forward uh, for complete streets analysis. And finally, not uh, even if none of those previous uh, points have, have triggered the complete streets requirement. Uh, if the project is in a population center that's an overburdened community, even if there isn't that record of planning work, we wanna forward that forward for further analysis, recognizing that overburdened communities may have been particularly challenged to have done that advanced planning work. 
So in the first uh, four and a half months uh, of implementation, we have screened about 350 projects statewide, and those cover design start dates uh, between you know, starting this year and going through 2028. And we're finding uh, a little over half of those uh, are then forwarded for, for further complete streets analysis. Uh, we are drawing on a number of tools that we have uh, developed within the agency. Uh, on the right here is our, our pavement management system. It's a straight line diagram uh, system, and it has embedded in it uh, information on our active transportation gaps, including cost estimates that came out of our statewide plan, uh, environmental health disparities ranking from uh, work that's been done by our Department of Health, uh, as well as the pavement conditions information. And it links directly to things like uh, Google to show where that project occurs in, in context. So a couple uh, examples of uh, projects that have gone through that screening. This is a, a fish passage barrier removal project where we'll be replacing a, a culvert with, with a facility that's easier for fish to, to travel through. Uh, this is in a rural area, and as uh, you can see in the map below, there's actually a parallel uh, trail that provides a low traffic stress facility through this area. So this is an example of a project that uh, would not have further complete streets analysis. Here's an example of a project where the complete streets requirement does apply. In the city of Burlington, uh, also happens to be an overburdened community. We've identified an active transportation plan that there are gaps, uh, and you can see it here in the picture, and we have an excited partner to work with us on this. So the, that screening, we're still new enough in implementation, that screening process has been a big part of our focus so far. Uh, we're increasingly will be getting into the alternatives development and our project delivery memo uh, sets out a number of goals and expectations for that. So touched on uh, the critical role of uh, working with communities, um, particularly being sensitive to the needs of overburdened communities, looking and addressing those active transportation gaps and that we will be constructing the facilities for people walking and biking to eliminate those gaps within the project limits. Uh, and that the facilities that we construct, our goal is to provide facilities with a level of traffic stress of two or better. And that uh, where speeds for vehicular traffic are over 30 miles per hour, that there needs, part of that needs to include separation uh, from, from vehicle traffic. And we have established in, in our guidance in the project delivery memo that uh, not only may we look at the space that we already have devoted to transportation differently, but that is one of the alternatives that we must consider and that we can do so uh, even if that might have some impacts to vehicular level of service uh, that we can consider the potential for mode, slif, mode shift in that analysis. So this helps us to really put the full range of uh, complete street solutions on the table. What's the right solution in each community is something that we've developed project by project with that community, but we can look at that full, full uh, spectrum. I just very quickly want to share, uh, this is a, re a resource available at the national level. It's currently out in pre-publication version, a uh, guidebook for roadway cross-section reallocation. So if that's you know, kind of questions you're grappling with, uh, a new resource that's out and available. And a uh, couple references here, and I know Megan will be putting more in the chat, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much, Celeste, uh, for sharing uh, the work that you all have been doing, as you said, very rapidly to embed a complete streets approach into project development thoroughly through your screening and your updated project delivery. Um, just want to remind folks that you can start asking questions in the Q&A feature now, and we'll hopefully get to as many as we can uh, uh, at the end of the session. 
So with that, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, Jackie DeWolf and Francisco Lavera. Go ahead, Jackie. <laughs> awesome. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. Um, awesome. Well, thank you, Smart Growth America and SSTI for organizing this event and having us today. And hello to everyone uh, tuning in. Uh, here to talk about how we're advancing complete streets here in Massachusetts. Um, many similarities um, from what I just heard in Washington. Um, and we were also asked to talk about our healthy transportation policy and engineering directive um, as policy impacts people's ability to move and their safety. I put an asterisk um, on the slide next to delivery because I want to stress that everything is policy delivery from both an official policy um, statement and, and directive to everyday design decisions, funding allocation, engagement strategy, project identification, snow and ice operations, communications. Um, it really is all the different ways that we are delivering um, policy to advance complete streets. So in Massachusetts, um, we're doing this from community grant programs and providing funding through our own transit priority initiatives, engineering directives, capital programs, training, research, cross-functional teams, um, capacity building, um, and more. Um, we're really excited um, and proud that for the first time, Massachusetts was named the number one bicycle-friendly state um, by the League of American Bicyc Bicyclists. Um, but I also want to uh, share that, you know, where we are today was not necessarily in our original plan, if you had asked us years ago. Um, and today we're going to tell you some of our official story of what the engineering directive is and also share more about the actual story of everything else that has made the engineering directive um, successful um, for the past few years. Um, additionally, our story starts decades ago with decisions by people made before us that set the stage for where we are today. Um, and we have a lot of people to thank for that. And we also have big plans for the future. So we're not stopping here just because we have this policy, this directive, and we're named um, number one biking state. We have lots more plans and things in the works. So just to quickly, an overview of our healthy transportation policy. Um, it was a result of a policy from back in 2013, um, which was followed by the first engineering directive in 2014, and later an updated engineering directive in 2020. So it's been our own iterative process to learn and evolve um, our standards and directives. Um, the really critical point was kind of moving away from the image on the left, um, which was just, you know, a bike symbol and a shoulder as a bicycle facility and really shifting focus to kind of high comfort, low stress um, and different types of facilities. Taking into account speed is a really critical aspect of that for us. Um, just this year, we launched a new approach to speed management focused first on and foremost identifying target speed. So the ideal speed you want people to move regardless of what the speed limit is, regardless of what today's existing speeds are. And then based on that target speed, figuring out how to achieve that speed and then deciding what type of roadway treatments are needed, um, whether sharing does make more sense or really needing to have that high comfort separation. And then that speed um, decisions influence um, the design standards and vice versa. So the pedestrian, so there's three main components of our engineering directive and criteria, pedestrian facilities, bike facilities, and transit facilities. Um, I don't have time to go into all of the details, and you can have access to all these details in our engineering directive, and I'm happy to follow up, um, but really just want to stress that our pedestrian facilities address both sidewalks and as well as crossings, um, which was new, newly added in 2020. For bike facilities, um, it's not just what is a bike facility, but it's based on speed, volume, number of travel lanes, um, and another, um, and many other uh, kind of components that kind of dictate the type of bike facility. One thing that I do want to highlight for the bike and ped is that there's a requirement for certain standards if the roadway is classified as a corridor as high potential for everyday biking or walking. This is a map of our potential for everyday biking, and the methodology calculates 
the likelihood of everyday short trips by biking if safe, comfortable, and convenient bikeways exists. And we have the same for potential for everyday walking. Um, we just did our first update of the methodology with new data inputs as our data gets more updated and sophisticated um, and with a plan to update it regularly. And then if something is a low potential for walking or biking, it doesn't mean we don't do complete streets or we don't accommodate them. It's just that on the flip side, we kind of up the ante where there's medium and high and have that as another, really it's a tool. It's you know an, an additional tool um, to help um, guide kind of decision-making. The transit provision is also really critical. Um, if we're really talking about complete streets, it's walking and biking, it's also transit um, and other modes. And so as of 2020, we require transit accommodations as part of all roadway projects. Um, and it touches on both transit priority treatments and as well as amenities, as well as crosswalks and um, coordination with regional transit agencies, however big or small, um, all across um, the state of Massachusetts. Um, all projects submit design justifications and within that document, they document bike and ped and transit provisions um, as, as part of kind of our design justification um, process. So lots of other things happen to make all this work possible. Um, advancing complete streets started with a vision and goals, the kind of what are, the, what are you striving for? And a, a major change in 2019 was putting out this vision that all people in Massachusetts will have a safe, comfortable and convenient option to walk and bike for everyday short trips um, with goals around set safety as well as increasing the percentage of short trips. And we grounded all of these goals with specific performance measures um, and equity checks. The premise for our work is really based on short trips. So historically transportation focused on the commute and peak 15 minutes and driving and shifting our focus to, to thinking about more trips, everyday trips, non-commute trips, short trips. And the majority of trips um, in Massachusetts are short um, and there is a correlation. So very few people are taking those trips by bike, but we also only have 2.5% of roadways with designated bike facilities currently. So definitely a connection there. And we're planning on how next on how to get 100% people have access to that high comfort walking and biking network um, to be able to make short everyday trips. Um, so, we have vision, you know, strong visions, goals, performance measures, policy document, engineering directive. Um, it's also been really critical for us to have all the corresponding guidance. Sometimes like the ones on the screen are things that we have developed and published, um, and then also relying on a lot of other guidance that have come from other states, organizations, and federal highway to achieve the best outcomes, not just minimums. Um, and furthermore, trainings have been really um, instrumental, um, training for relationship building, training for sharing information, trainings also are part of discussing challenges and how to overcome them and kind of really hands on, um, you know, discussion and meetings. Um, we do this with our own colleagues and we also host trainings um, for the professional design community that are offered, often doing the work as consultants um, for us um, and for municipalities. So now I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Francisco, who's gonna continue this story um, about other things that are happening um, and how we're advancing complete streets in Massachusetts. Thank you, Jackie. And um, thank you for everyone who's hosting and everyone who's watching um, the webinar uh, today. Uh, as we know, and I'm not telling anyone anything that we don't already know. Every time that we do a design change, the further advanced the design, the more costly it's gonna be as well as longer to deliver the project. So we, we have learned that unexpected, quote unquote, outcome of our process. So the more that we are working on this, the more that we're realizing that we need to get in part of the conversations in the next slide, uh, Jackie, we, we need to be part of the conversations as early as possible. Originally, we thought it was 95%. It would be a great time to start making changes to the cross section. We realized that we're already too late uh, and, and, and creating, again, those changes that are costly and affecting the delivery time. Scoping seems to be like a good idea. And we're realizing now that we need to be on the table 
at the time that we're initiating a project, where we're discussing what needs to be done, that's the time where we have a better opportunity to not only provide our elements, but be able to do it in a way that we're cordial, we have, we maintain our relationships, we're not burning any bridges and whatnot. Part of the lessons learned, like next slide, we have been uh, able to know that it's very helpful as we're implementing all our policies to find allies. And I'm not saying that everyone in the department is not working with you, but if you are able to convey your voice and your message through other uh, voices, it would be great. Uh, and when you have everyone at the table and you explain them, this is why I'm doing this. Let me let me hear why is it that you're feeling that what we're trying to do, putting bike lanes, uh, winding sidewalks, or, or uh, providing transit amenities are not are, are going to hurt what you're thinking that you want to do. And you engage everyone. You get a buy-in. You 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 build those relationships. Uh, the example that we have on the screen: we were working on a project, an arterial in a urban area in Boston, and we're trying to figure out what to do with with uh, the people who want a bike and instead of trying to figure out how we're going to be able to we're going to end exposing them to traffic or not uh, someone other than uh, than myself or from my office came up with like why don't we do a race uh, in uh, a, a race a bicycle lane so that that is one good example that we had another example that we have uh, sometimes the current design stages, the current design process that we, we do, uh, Jackie on the next slide, um, we run into issues where uh, this particular location, there is a greenway that is extended from the left to the right, and we're crossing uh, under the interstate right there on that section. It's an idea location, two lanes in each direction. Maybe we can squeeze everything to one side and, and take a space for, for people who want to bike and walk on a separated area. Tough luck. There are piers for the bridge that we cannot move currently. So what we did uh, in order to convince people that this could work, let's take a lane in a temporary basis, in a, a, in a demonstration project type of event. So it was great. It's working. We're still waiting for information about what how, how that is working. But instinctively, you take the space away and people are gonna use it. So that was a great lesson learned. And we're actually building relationships with, with the town and with the business in that area that's feeling that it's not gonna work. Another example that we have is that <clears throat> uh, sometimes even though you may have a vision to what your career is gonna be, like uh, the next slide, uh, Jackie, you may not have the opportunity to do it. We have a bridge project and you can see over there the green space. When you have that, that, that project, ideally we would love to change the whole um, corridor, but the scope is very narrowed into the bridge. Fine, we're not gonna ask as part of this project to change three miles, four miles of corridor, but let's make sure that whatever we're building as a, as a bridge infrastructure is going to allow us when we are ready five, six, 10 years down the road that we can come back and instead of, no, we can't implement those changes again in, anymore because you have a bridge and just replace a, 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 an element that is gonna be, or intended to be there for 50 years is not gonna be there. It, it's not gonna be the problem. So we're, we're working on, on, on elements like that. Uh, the other thing that we are realizing as we are implementing our policies in, in the next slide, uh, Jackie, is that, not only we're doing all of our projects in, in as part of the state good repair projects, but we're also creating a new program, which is specifically to modernize our infrastructure to provide elements that and spaces that can be used for people who want to want to walk or bike. We don't want to force everyone to walk or bike. We just want to give them the option. So arterial area in in you know, near Massachusetts, heavily transit, heavily used. There is ex ex specifically the need for that. So what are we doing? We are resurfacing now, and then we are coming back in a few years with a full full project that is going to change the the, the whole area of the image, the, 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 the image of that area. So we're looking into very creative ways to do it. And we have success stories. So uh, we have had projects like the one that is shown there, Highland Avenue. We're making space for people who are walking and biking. We have another project in Route 135 where we're taking space again for more vehicles. So we're making space for people who want to bike and people who want to walk. Uh, we also have another project which is in the Science Museum, near the Science Museum in Boston, Cambridge area. 
you can see how it was and how it is now. It's a much more environment, much more comfortable environment for people who want to walk and bike. We have another project in Route 128 uh, in, in, in Massachusetts, Massachusetts area. Same, same thing. We're making a space for uh, everyone who wants to walk and bike. And, and, and just to close on this bright idea of everything, as Jackie mentioned, we had an original intent. The official story may be one, but when you're in the trenches, when you're doing work, it's, it's, it's not as easy as it can be. Uh, you have just to, to, to understand that maybe sometimes you may have three steps forward and one step back, but we keep moving forward. So with that, I'll close it. The last slide is our contact information. We'll be happy to answer more questions and I'll pass it on to our next presenter. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much. It's so good to hear about MassDOT's incredibly comprehensive approach. Uh, there's so much in there to be excited about, I think. I, I, I personally was really excited to hear about that methodology for identifying uh, areas with the highest latent demand for biking and walking. Um, with that, we have our final speaker, Nissa Tupper, who is the Transportation and Public Health Planning Director uh, within MINDOT's Office of Sustainability and Public Health. So take it away, Nissa. All right, thanks so much, Rayla. Um, so I'm not going to go through what complete streets are because I'm pretty sure we've got that covered. I'll just provide some background about what we're doing here in Minnesota, um, including some exciting new updates. So um, we have had a complete streets policy in place since 2013. Um, that ensures compliance with a state statute that directs a MnDOT to have um, a policy and implement it. Um, it also really is a way for us to operate, operationalize our um, mission, which includes uh, maximizing the health of people, the environment, and our economy. And I think that health piece um, for people, environment, and economy is um, a perfect segue and tie-in um, for Complete Streets. Um, so the office I work in, Office of Sustainability and Public Health, um, is newer within the last few years at MnDOT, as is my position, um, and that prompted us to take a look at what are those um, public health what are those levers that we have, policy levers, that can really help to advance public health? And that's where Complete Streets came in. Um, we heard that from folks inside the agency and also from stakeholders externally. So we did um, a pretty robust evaluation of our policy and what the barriers and challenges were, opportunities that we could um, expand upon um, during the first year and a half um, when I joined. Um, and then we had just finished an update, taking all that feedback um, and providing some, some updates to better inform how we're implementing that policy in a more consistent way, how we're measuring success, how we're communicating about that. Um, so one thing that's um, come online since we started is the safe system approach. So I'm sure many folks are familiar with that. Um, and really complete streets is a way to help advance many of those priorities um, under safe system approach. Um, it's really about a making a process shift um, and changing our thinking and really recognizing that human beings are fragile, right? Um, and so under the safe system approach, um, it's all about eliminating those fatal and serious injuries by making sure we're accommodating for human mistakes um, and then keeping impacts if there are mistakes um, on the human body at tolerable levels. So that's really fundamental and we've been um, positioning complete streets as really um, an important implementation strategy of the safe system approach. Um, you know, one where um, we're putting in those redundant systems um, to prevent those uh, fatalities and serious injuries. Um, and specifically, safe speeds and safe roads um, are two of the ways that Complete Street supports a safe system approach. I'm not going to go into safe speeds because that was covered a little bit earlier. Um, but in terms of safety, um, for our update and um, the work that we're doing, it's really um, embedded in safety for all. You know, if we don't have a safe street for our most vulnerable um, road users, then we don't have a safe street at all. Um, so this uh, chart here is showing um, traffic fatalities in Minnesota, and the top trend line is looking at motor vehicle traffic fatalities, and we're seeing that trend line go down, which is great. Um, when we look in that same time period at the fatality trend for non-motorists, so people walking and biking, um, you can see the opposite. Those are going up. So that is something that we really need to focus on and recognize that there's a disproportionate burden placed on those who are walking and biking um, in our community. Communities. We have a um, crash facts report that comes out and when we looked at that um, to start to understand more about why um, 
uh, one of the most frequent uh, contributing crash factors for people walking um, in terms of getting into a crash with a motor vehicle is darting or dashing into the roadway. Um, and so I think, you know, that points to um, the importance of those design interventions that um, the complete streets approach can contribute that help create more predictability of movement for all users on the roadway um, to help us make more progress in that area of um, non-motorist safety. And then unpacking a little bit uh, more for Minnesota, um, and I'm sure this could be done in other states, we wanted to understand um, geographically and then also by race when we're thinking about equity, um, what does that look like for, um, for safety? So um, Minnesota rural counties continue to experience a higher traffic uh, fatality rate than our metro counties. Um, and specific to non-motorized crashes, people walking and biking in rural Minnesota are more likely to be struck and killed by drivers than people walking in our metro um, communities. Um, when we look at bicycling safety, um, one of our recent surveys identified from folks um, uh, not enough dedicated bike lanes or lack of shoulder width as top issues. Um, poor, poor road maintenance was also a concern um, uh, for rural, but also for metro residents who are walking and biking. Um, and then specific to walking in both um, our uh, metro area and greater Minnesota um, residents identified not enough sidewalks or trails as um, their greatest concerns. So on the um, chart on the right, when we think about um, equity by race, uh, we know that communities of color have suffered as a result of our transit and transportation policies and that we've seen that play out um, at the national level. And that certainly has played out in Minnesota as well, um, where people of color in Minnesota continue to experience a larger burden of being struck and killed by drivers than um, white or non-Hispanic Americans. And what I have um, circled here is especially Black and American Indian populations in Minnesota um, continue to um, experience um, a higher percentage of fatalities um, than others when comparing percent of population to percent of fatalities. So those are some numbers that um, we're keeping our eye on. And this is one of my favorite um, terms to come out of Smart Growth America, incomplete streets. So, you know, it's likely inadvertent, um, but many of our um, past transportation planning and design has resulted in incomplete streets, um, streets that are not safe places for people to walk, bike, or take transit. And the complete streets approach is about making a safe and comfortable approach for everyone. Um, the incomplete streets, uh, there's a couple images here. There's a great library online um, through Smart Growth America of examples here, um, but I'm sure we can find these in any community, unfortunately. These are particularly dangerous for people um, who need to or want to walk, um, in particular people of color, older adults, children, um, those living in low-income communities. Um, they're already suffering disproportionately when we look at um, illness, injury, and death. So. Um, our update to our complete streets policy is really grounded in relative vulnerability, meaning the relative vulnerability to injury or death when involved in a vehicle related crash. So our new guidance outlines what this means by general user group, which is on the left hand side there. Um, you know, the, the image on the right, I think I've seen Celeste share this before, um, you know, there's an inherent relative safety provided to um, drivers by the vehicles they're in. You know, you think about seat belts, airbags, the mass of the vehicle, the speed. Um, and then you look at the relative vulnerability of people walking and biking. Sometimes we have a stripe of paint. Sometimes we're lucky enough to have um, elevated um, separation, but we need to really be considering that um, and grounding ourselves in that when we're taking a complete streets approach. Um, second, our updated implementation guidance um, considers expected volume of users based on context and land use type, um, because we know our complete streets approach needs to be sensitive to local context and flexible uh, to accommodate that there's different needs in urban, suburban, rural, and more um, settings. So the thumbnails you see here are the nine context categories that are in our um, upcoming um, design uh, facility design guide. And um, these context categories really recognize that unique combination of land use characteristics that reflect the, the place, the destinations, activities, um, and the people that are um, along or near the infrastructure, either now or in the future. So where we've landed is we have a, um, combined that relative vulnerability and expected volume by context to give a baseline transportation hierarchy um, for our staff as a starting point. So I have two examples shown here. Um, we have this built out for all nine. Um, this is in our um, handbook that's on our webpage. 
um, and it, the hierarchy assigns value for each context category um, and those user groups based on high, medium, or low. So um, the you know high rating here means that that user group merits a higher level of consider consideration given their relative vulnerability and their expected volume. Um, so this, you know, is a starting point that our staff uh, will be using in um, collaboration with local partners to understand what are those unique um, characteristics and considerations for this project and community, what type of adjustments should we be, make, should we be making um, and why. And then um, we have a new reporting form um, so that we can track and understand and be accountable for these decisions that we're making. Um, and I think too, articulating it in a way um, to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, the other thing, um, well, there's lots of things that go with our policy update, um, but the other thing I wanted to mention today is that um, we will be measuring performance by both tracking some um, process and outcome performance measures. Um, so, you know, process measures, we need to have a good um, robust data set of how our projects are doing. Um, and so tracking completion of those project report forms, tracking um, approval by our project sponsors, um, you know, they're really the ones who are responsible um, for, for the whole project portfolio at the district level. Um, and then the outcome measures, and these are tied to um, many of our related um, programs. And so our Office of Transit and Active Transportation has a number of measures um, that need to be tracked um, that came out of new plans. And this is a perfect place to tie those together. Um, so bicycling improvements, equitable walking improvements, um, safety, so looking at those proven safety countermeasures. Um, and then in general, how are we doing with meeting different user group needs? So our office is taking over reporting of these um, will be circling back with districts and we really want to make this a um, ongoing um, feedback loop um, so that we're working with our staff you know not giving them um, a mandate that's um, untenable but making revisions along the way understanding what's working well what's not um, and what what support that we can be providing um, from a central office perspective as well so um, we have a brand new website, encourage folks to check that out. There's our updated policy and handbook on here as well as, as, well as um, lots of background content. And um, I will hand it back over to Rayla. Thank you. Thank you, Nissa. Awesome. So we have a few minutes for question and answer. I would invite all of our uh, panelists to turn their camera on. Um, so I'm going to start with a question that was uh, directed for all of you, which is uh, given that a lot of, of the folks attending this webinar, I think, are not actually staff within state DOTs. Do you have advice for how local uh, communities, advocates and local staff um, can engage constructively, basically, with state DOTs? If they want to see complete streets happen, what do you all need, basically, to help them make that happen in a way that's a productive relationship? Love to uh, hear any thoughts on that. I'm happy to kick it off. Um, so I think that there's a couple of things um, and would love other panelists to chime in. Um, there's so much to say here. So actually I'm more silent because there's so many different directions uh, to take this. Um, I think one is it's always important important for people to share what they're experiencing on the ground you know it doesn't even mean if it doesn't doesn't matter if you have a solution or you have an idea actually and sometimes it's even better not to but really just to kind of identify a problem a pain point you know where you feel uncomfortable and just ele and, and share that right um because um the communities you know know best where they're experiencing these places every day um and so just to to bring that to life and actually just share that with if if it's state dot property to you know make sure your state dot knows about it um the other really critical thing with just the, you know it's specific to massachusetts but i know every state is different with kind of different levels of government um if you have a strong regional or county system in Massachusetts, we don't. It's really 351 cities and then the state, um, but working with, you know, directly with the municipality um, as well um, to um, coordinate with the state DOT. Um, and then the other thing is, um, you know, sharing what you learned today, um, you know, that different things are happening across the country. There's different examples. You know, a couple of years ago, I don't think there was one state DOT presentation about demonstration projects and, you know, putting out cones. And now we're seeing that um, in all different parts of the country. So 
um, just sharing examples and inspiring kind of what's possible um, is really critical too. And we look for that. I look for that. I want to hear from people. I want to hear from communities like, hey, check this out. Have you seen this? Would MassDoc consider that? And that just helps get, you know, everything going as well. Yeah, uh, I add on to that. Uh, Raylo is talking about it being an approach and there's so many aspects to it. So yeah, everything Jackie said and, and really whatever connection you can make, it, it's it's the combination of, of all of the things, it, it all helps. You know, it's the, the having those conversations with your, your local jurisdiction, connecting with your regional office. Uh, we, we were primed and ready, but the actions that our legislature took have been transformative for our ability to actually deliver. Uh, so it, it really is the, 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 the whole picture. Yeah, I'll just add on to that. Um... It's, you know, it's most helpful when we think about transportation in terms of a system. So, so like what Celeste was saying, it's like, at, it's at every level. Um, and so the more you can do about talking to people about complete streets, which is really, we need safe streets for everybody who's using them, um, the better so that when, you know, there are new DOT projects going through different municipalities, there isn't a surprise, you know, where there's intersections and there needs to be collaboration about how this system works together. So please share what you've learned. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, Jackie, you mentioned uh, pilot projects and demonstration projects. Um, we have a question about that, and I know folks started to answer it in the uh, Q&A chat, but I do want to elevate it here, too, because um, I, I, I think you're right that um, a few years ago, we wouldn't have seen state DOTs really doing pilot projects like you talked about, like other states are doing. Um, can you talk a little bit about what makes that work? How long should projects run for? How do you evaluate whether they're meeting objectives? And how do you um, set yourself up from the front end to know and be able to tell that story basically of whether they're doing what they're supposed to and that's open to anyone as well. I'll be happy to answer that a little bit because uh, the, the specific example that was shown there, um, we the big concern from the mall that is not located to the north is that they're not going to have enough space for people coming to their mall and they're going to lose business. So we work with the municipality, we work with the mall, to find a time that was going to have sufficient uh, traffic volumes, not Black Friday, obviously, but something sometime of the year that would call uh, big traffic volumes. And this was around Halloween in the town is very close to Salem Mass, uh, which has a lot of uh, attractions. Um, so we work with them to set it up. Uh, we figure out that uh, at least one peak hour, uh, one day weekday of peak hours, and over the weekend uh, would provide us enough information to see if it is going to fail, which we were confident that it was not. And we did traffic counts before or with and without the uh, with the demonstration project. We also found some areas where the turns were a little bit tight. So it, it was very helpful in that, um, in, in that regard. So um, it depends on, on the area, I would say. And Jackie, I yeah. think you have more insight on the other project that we did. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, from the Mass Ave Bridge, Route 28, 3A, I can now name a lot of places where we've used cones and flex posts. I would say they serve a really important purpose when we are proposing something drastically different and it's an opportunity. If, if you have the opportunity, obviously sometimes you, you can't always use cones to actually demonstrate what you want to do, but when sometimes when there's just like that drastic change um, and and you want to be able to demonstrate it. Um, the second thing is to actually just test something right before you spend the capital dollars, you know, this is not, you know, cheap, right, like changing curbs and moving things around. And so we have found it as like a really amazing tool um, in our own kind of decision making process. And so it's not. I think sometimes it's perceived as like reflecting priorities, like, oh, is Complete Streets your priority? And it's like, no, we're just figuring out how. And so the Mass Ave Bridge, which I put another link to, you know, we did cones overnight super quickly. Well, it's taking a year to decide to make it permanent, but really what's taking time is, it's not a question about Complete Streets. It's really a question of like, how do you, how do you actually make it permanent now? And how do you make it really work at the approaches to the bridge? 
So um, huge advocate for this approach. And I think there's no one size fits all. Sometimes you just needed to do it for a day, for three days, as Francisco said. Others we've had up, you know, for longer while we're kind of figuring out a permanent solution. And some we like, you know, change as we go. Um, but yeah, yeah. Awesome. I, I've, I've heard said the, the pilot is the process and, and the, the value of seeing things on the ground to kind of get past some of the ways that things can get tied up in knots. Uh, we did that not, not actually on the ground, but for a roundabout project where there would be a, a bus rapid transit service that would need to navigate the roundabout. And there was a lot of questions about how that would function. And so um, we laid out the, the design at our transit agency's um, bus base and, and then we're able to see how it would operate and, and see any need to, to make uh, adjustments to the design it was really effective. Great. Um, Chris, I think it's probably about time that you should jump back in here. Yeah, unfortunately, I had other questions yeah. I wanted to get to. <laughs> we have a lot of questions. I think we are nearing the end. And I know um, our speakers at the beginning were talking about how much they were struggling to fit um, everything they wanted to say <laughs> into the 10, 10 minutes or so that they had here. Um, so thank you all for doing a great job um, packing it in. Clearly, we could keep talking about this for, for a while. Um, and thanks, Rayla, for taking us through that. Um, and for leading the charge on complete streets. Um, fortunately, um, even though we have to wrap up um, for today, um, uh, us at SSTI and Smart Growth America are continuing to work with all the folks here and in other states um, to keep complete streets policies moving forward um, and to track best practices and try and uh, make those more readily available for folks um, so that everyone knows what's going on, all the great stuff that they can learn from and pull from. Um, so with that, um, I think we're going to wrap up. I'll just remind folks there is a, a survey link in the um, in the chat, and um, we'll follow up with folks. Um, but just thanks again, everyone, for showing up today. Um, this stuff is really exciting, and um, it's great to to always hear what's what's new.